there was a man walking along a cliff, and he fell off it. It was dark, and he couldn't see below, but he was able to grab a branch on the way down and was hanging around for some time. He cried out to anyone who was up there for help. There was silence for a time, and then a voice said, Yes, do you want help? Yes, I want help, he replied, thinking, what a dumb question. Who are you? I'm God, came back the response from above. God? Yes, I'm Yahweh, King of kings and Lord of lords. God, you know the one who knows all and who loves everyone, who is holy and who seeks to save the lost? But what about people like me hanging off the cliff? Are you going to help me, the man asked. Yes, what do you need, God replied. Another dumb question from the creator of the world, the man thought. I need to get down without hurting myself. God replied, then let go. What? Let go? Yes, just let go. The man thought about it for a few minutes and then asked, is there anyone else up there? If the man had simply trusted God by faith and let go, he would have realized it was only a two-foot drop to the ground, which he could not see in the dark night. Many of us would admit we have faith in God, but unfortunately our faith in the Lord is something we proclaim with our lips, but it's not lived out. The life we live does not evidence the faith we should have in our Almighty God, and so we look for other alternatives. We ask the same question of the man who didn't like God's instructions. Is there anyone else up there? Sadly, we may have more faith in other things rather than in God. For example, if you get sick and need to go to the emergency room, we see a doctor there whose name we don't know and whose degree we don't see. He gives us a prescription we can't read or understand. And then by faith, we take it to a pharmacy and give the prescription to a pharmacist whom we don't know how well trained they are, and then take medicines that we aren't sure will heal as is anticipated or promised. Yet we do these things because we have faith that these professionals know what they're doing. Unfortunately, when it comes to our faith in a living, all-powerful God who is faithful and loving, we justify in our minds why we can't obey what He tells us to do for our good, or we make lots of excuses. As we continue our study in the first 11 chapters of Genesis in our sermon series, When Giants Walk the Earth, we want to see how Noah lived the life of faith, not through lip service, but through tangible action. Of all the people who could make excuses and justify why what God was asking him to do was crazy and not worth following, it would be Noah. And yet, because of his unwavering faith walk with God, he would save his life, his family's life, and in fact, the human race, by simply following what God told him to do by faith. Turn to me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6 as we study verses 9 to 22. Genesis chapter 6 verses 9 to 22. We want to draw out some biblical principles for how to really live a life of faith like Noah. Now, it's important to be reminded of the condition of the people during Noah's time. So, if you would allow me to go back a few verses and read verses 5 to 7, and then verses 11 and 12. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that He had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I've made them. And now verses 11 and 12. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. As we discussed last week, only a few generations after God created the world, Mankind became very sinful and wicked, and God was grieved and brokenhearted because of the sins and evils of man. Even though mankind had made great progress in the arts and in the advancements in civilization, as it has happened throughout human history, the luxuries of life produced infamous immorality, cruelty, and widespread indifference to God and the things of God. So it is in our world and generation today technological advancements that have bettered the quality of our lives have also created an atmosphere of hypersexualization, the normalization and acceptance of evil and violence, and indifference to God and His Word. Sin, evil, and wickedness characterize the world in Noah's time, 
and a holy God had to deal with it by destroying the earth. After listening to last week's message, someone asked me if in verses 6 and 7, God was changing His mind, or if God made a mistake in creating humanity. Let me quickly answer this question. In Christian theology and doctrine, we have a term that describes the unchangeable nature of God, which is that He is immutable. This is clearly taught in the Bible. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. But now it seemed that God changed His mind about creating people. However, there is no contradiction in the Scriptures. When the Bible says that God is sorry and grieved in His heart, the point is that He has not changed in His character or in what He stands for. Instead, we have a description of our Lord in terms of human emotions and passions called anthropomorphism. So when the Bible says that God is sorry for doing this or that, it means that God is expressing sorrow for what the people had done to themselves, just as a parent might express sorrow for a rebellious child. God was sorry that the people chose sin and death instead of a relationship with Him which brings life and blessings. God does not change in His character, His person, or His plans, but He can and does respond to our changes. Just as the Bible says He responds to our prayers, it is something I do not fully understand how it all works out with my limited human mind, but what I do know is that our God, who is unchangeable, immutable, is grieved in His heart by the sins of mankind, and in His rightful anger and just punishment, decided to destroy mankind and all living things. However, God will not destroy all of humanity because of one man, Noah. Look at verses 8 to 10. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The Bible tells us God would not destroy mankind because Noah, who is described in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, as a preacher of righteousness, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In a backdrop of a sinful and evil world, Noah stood unique and strong. He stood apart from the world. Now, Noah was not a perfect person. He had sinned and deserved to die. But God chose him by His grace to save. And just like us, God didn't have to save mankind or to even provide a way of salvation for mankind, as all mankind was rightfully destined to eternal damnation. But God chose us to be saved for no other reason than by His grace. Now, what made Noah different from everyone else in his generation? What was it that made God take notice of Noah? Look again at verse 9. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Sandwiched between the two sections of verses on how evil the world was is a commentary of why God did not destroy the entire human race, because He found one who was a righteous man, who stood apart from his generation. While his generation did not walk with God, Noah was a man who did. You know, it would not have been easy for Noah to stand apart from what the rest of his generation did. No one would have faulted Noah if he lived a life of sin because everyone was living that type of life. It was the norm. You and I know this to be true in our own lives. It really isn't easy to stand on your own against the wishes and expectations of the majority. No one wants to be different. Everyone wants to fit in. No one wants to be the unique one. And yet in the Christian life, we are told by God to stand apart from the world, to be different, to stand firm for our biblical convictions, even if we are in the minority. We are called to be salt and light to this evil world, which requires us to stand apart and call out what is wrong and evil. God was looking for someone in Noah's generation who had the courage to be different, to buck the trend, someone willing to stand apart even if it meant standing alone. For God to save the human race from a judgment of global flood, He was going to ask a person to build an extremely large boat, an ark. That person would be ridiculed and laughed at because never before had there been a need for such a large boat as there had never been a catastrophic global flood. The person who would build the ark must be willing to stand apart from the world 
even if it meant standing alone. In fact, God is looking for the same type of people in our generation today, men and women who have the courage to live by faith, by standing apart from the world, even if it means standing alone. From this, we draw out our first biblical principle for what it means to live by faith. Biblical principle number one, living by faith requires us to stand apart from the world, even if it means standing alone. Living by faith requires us to stand apart from the world, even if it means standing alone. I love the story told of a young surgical nurse who was completing her first full day of responsibilities in the operating room of a large hospital. As one responsible for counting what was used on the patient, she said to the chief surgeon, Doctor, you've removed only 11 sponges, and we've used 12 sponges on the patient. But the doctor declared, I've removed them all. We'll close the incision now. No, the new surgical nurse objected. We've used 12 sponges, and I see only 11, she insisted. Again, the doctor said, I'll take full responsibility. I've removed all the sponges. We close up the patient now. And then he shouted, suture. You can't do that, blazed the nurse. Think of the patient. At which point, the surgeon smiled, lifted his foot, and showed the nurse the 12th sponge he had hidden. Welcome to the hospital surgical team. You will do well here, he said. If you were that nurse on the first day of your job, would you dare to go up against or be willing to contradict the chief surgeon? It's not as easy as you think. My friends, standing apart from the world is no easy task, especially when you feel all alone and the people telling you how to live and how to think and what to do are more prominent, more popular, have more money, and are in the majority. Do you have the courage to live by faith and do what is right, even if you are all alone in standing for the truth? I know it's very difficult to speak up for what is right and wrong according to what the Bible says, because it's not in line with the values and the worldview of this world. But isn't it interesting how we will fight and argue, even with complete strangers on social media, about what we believe to be the best ice cream, the best drink, the tastiest restaurant, the most beautiful beach, the most comfortable bike, the best gadget, the most useful operating system, the most encrypted messaging app, the most fit candidate for political office. But when it comes to biblical truths that differ from the world's standards, we just remain silent. Partly, I think it's because we may feel like we're the only ones left among our friends and family who advocate for godly ways and biblical truths, and it is a lonely feeling. But I remember another man in the Bible who stood apart from the world for the Lord, but it meant he had to stand alone from his evil generation. His name was Elijah, and he was a prophet of God who spoke truth in a very challenging environment. In fact, Elijah was so spiritually, physically, and emotionally tired from dealing with evil King Ahab and wicked Queen Jezebel and standing for the Lord that he even complained to God that he was the only one left but God said to him in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, Hang in there, Elijah. Press on. Persevere. You are not the only one standing up for me. There are 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to the false god Baal. In the New Testament, God uses the church for us to find encouragement when we feel lonely. And that's why it's important to get plugged into the life of the church, whether in person or virtually. Christian community through small groups, such as in a life group, is where you can be with other like-minded men and women who can encourage you and help you realize that you are not all alone in wanting to live out and stand for Christian truths and principles. Thankfully, when Noah looked around and saw how everyone was living in sin, instead of saying this must be the norm, he was disgusted by the evil in the world and chose to walk with God and preach righteousness and truth to his generation. He stood apart and was willing to even stand alone. My friends, if we're really to live a life of faith, instead of just paying lip service to living out a life of faith, then we have to make a personal decision to stand apart from the world, even if it means standing alone. By faith, we need to press on and persevere just like Noah. We don't need to follow what everyone else is doing or what the world is calling us to do because we preach a truth, albeit often unpopular, 
that is both timeless and saves. The world may not want to hear about Jesus, but we should not be deterred and ashamed to declare that Jesus Christ alone saves and to declare that living our lives for Him is what will bring purpose, satisfaction, and eternal rewards. Now look at me at verses 13 to 16. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Here in verses 13 to 16, God gave instructions for Noah to build a very large boat. The ark was to be a flat bottom rectangular vessel, 450 foot long, 75 foot wide, and 45 foot high, with an estimated displacement of some 43,300 tons and with three decks. It was as long as one and a half soccer fields and as high as a four story building. Amazingly, the ark was six times longer than it was wide, the same ratio used by some modern shipbuilders. This was definitely a seaworthy vessel. Also, something very important I want you to notice. Noah's ark was not designed to be navigated or controlled by the people in the boat because there was no rudder or sail mentioned. The boat and all those in the ark would be completely at the mercy of God and controlled by His hands. Noah and his family would have no control in navigating this ark. Would you have enough faith to get into a boat without any control systems? Is that something you would be willing to do if placed in a similar situation as Noah? Giving the control of our lives to God and letting Him direct us with us having no control and simply trusting Him by faith? The construction of this ark was an exercise of faith in God. But getting into the ark would also be an exercise of faith in God. You see, my friends, living out a life of faith should not be compartmentalized to only certain aspects of your life. When you and I live a life of faith, we trust in God completely, ceding Him control of all of our lives and willingly going through whatever experience He deems is best for us to go through. While Noah was listening to God's instruction, Perhaps one of the things that may have been running through his mind was why did God need such a large boat? There were only eight of us in our immediate family. Who else was coming? Noah would soon find out when God gets to the animal part. But as amazing as the sheer dimensions of the boat that Noah was to build and the fact that there was no control system, what was even more amazing is that Noah did not doubt or object to God's wisdom and leading and asking him to take on this project. There were no questions from Noah at all. Perhaps he was so used to living by faith and walking with God that his faith walk was evidenced by his complete trust in God through the entire process, and so there was no need to ask any questions. I know myself well enough to know that if I was in Noah's shoes, I would have about a hundred different questions that God had to answer before I would embark on his project. God, why such a large boat? Lord, why are there no sails or rudders? Can I have a control system in the ark just in case we're about to hit a mountaintop? Lord, why out of gopher wood? Aren't there other woods more easily accessible that I could use? God, did you check the dimensions with a certified shipbuilding engineer? Lord, do you want a second opinion to make sure you know what you're talking about? I would have so many questions. But living by faith is learning not to question God so much as exemplified by the life of Noah. Another thing we notice is that not only are there no questions, but Noah gives no excuses for why he could not do what was asked of him. It would have been very easy for Noah to give a litany of excuses for why it could not be done. Excuses that we are accustomed to giving when God tells us to do something in the Bible. Noah didn't tell God, sorry, I don't have the skill set to build such a boat. Lord, don't you know how much this is going to cost? I don't have the money. Or God, this is going to mess up my reputation amongst the people. They're going to think I'm crazy. 
or I don't have the manpower, Lord, to build something so large and complicated. There were no excuses when God told Noah to build the ark. He simply did it by faith, knowing that what God had instructed and commanded, He would provide and enable to get done. Let me repeat that. What God had instructed and commanded, He would provide and enable to get done. Let me share with you a funny hypothetical exchange between Noah and God. And the Lord said unto Noah, Where is the ark which I commanded you to build? And Noah said unto the Lord, Lord, sorry, I've had three carpenters that are sick. The gopher wood supplier has let me down and did not deliver, even though the gopher wood order has been placed more than 12 months now. What can I do? And the Lord said unto Noah, I want that ark finished even after seven days and seven nights. And Noah said, it will be so, but it was not so. And the Lord said unto Noah, what seems to be the trouble this time? And Noah said unto the Lord, my subcontractor hath gone bankrupt. The peach and tar which you commanded me to put on the outside and on the inside of the ark has not arrived. The plumber has gone on strike. Shem, my son, who helped me on the ark side of the business, has formed a boy band with his brothers, Ham and Japheth. Lord, I just don't know what to do now. And the Lord grew angry and said, And what about the animals, the male and female of every sort, that I ordered to come unto you to keep their kind alive on the face of the earth? And Noah said, They had been delivered to the wrong address, but they should arrive on Friday. And the Lord said, How about the unicorns and the fowls of the air by sevens? And Noah wrung his hands and wept, saying, Lord, unicorns are a discontinued line. You can't get them for any amount of money. And fowls of the air are sold only in sixes and not sevens. Lord, Lord, you know how it is. Life is so hard. Dealing with this wicked world makes me want to pull my hair out. And the Lord, in His wisdom, said, Noah, my son, I know. I know what you're going through. Why else do you think I've caused the flood to descend upon the earth and destroy it? Good thing this is only a hypothetical story. And the ark did get built. But it rings so very true for how we ourselves in this present life make so many excuses for why we are unable to accomplish great things for the Lord. Because instead of praying and seeking help from the all-powerful God to get it done, We are busy making excuses for why it can't be done. You see, if Noah didn't have a close faith walk with God, he would only look at the capabilities of what he could do alone himself and see this as a project that was nearly impossible. Imagine building a ship the size of one and a half soccer fields and as high as a four-story building without modern technological help. But there were no excuses or questions from Noah because Noah's faith walk was such that he recognized the all-powerful enablement of the God who told him what to do. My friends, we don't need to make excuses for God. If God asks us to do something, He will give us the power and ability to accomplish it. We just need to trust in the enabling power of the Almighty God. Several decades ago, comedians Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks did an irreverent comedy skit called the 2013-year-old man. In the skit, Reiner interviews Brooks, who is a 2013-year-old gentleman. At one point, Reiner asked the old ancient man, did you always believe in the Lord? Brooks replied, no. We had a guy in our village named Phil, and for a time we worshipped him. Reiner responded, you worshipped a guy named Phil? Why? Brooks responded, because he was big and mean, and he could break you in two with his bare hands. Reiner asked, did you have prayers? Brooks responded, yes. Would you like to hear one? Oh, Phil, please don't be mean and hurt us or break us in two with your bare hands. So Reiner asked, so when did you start worshiping the Lord? Brooks responded, well, one day a big thunderstorm came up and a lightning bolt hit Phil. We gathered around and saw that he was dead. Then we said to one another, there's something bigger than Phil. That phrase, there must be something bigger, is a reminder that the excuses of our lives 
come when we dwell only on our own inadequacies and focus on the world's limitations. There are no excuses for why we cannot accomplish the work that God has called us to do when we have the faith to recognize the truth that Almighty God is here to help us. Now, putting together everything we've talked about, we have our second biblical principle for what it means to live by faith. Biblical principle number two. Living by faith necessitates us learning not to question God nor give excuses. Living by faith necessitates us learning not to question God nor give excuses. Who is God and what you believe about Him? If the God you and I have faith in is the same God who has revealed Himself in the Bible, then it is only natural that we will not question a sovereign God, nor will we give excuses to and for an omnipotent God. I read now verses 17 and 18. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. In these verses, God tells Noah he will destroy the world with a global flood and everything will die. But God gives his assurance that Noah and his family will not die even as those on earth would. God's promise is that he would establish his covenant with Noah. And for that to happen, Noah had to remain alive. You see, you can't make a covenant or agreement with someone who is dead. I'm sure that when Noah got into the boat and it started to rain heavily, and it didn't stop for 40 days and 40 nights, and with no rudder or control system, and the ark is barely clearing the mountaintops and hitting treetops, there would be some anxiety for Noah. What did Noah have to hold on to to calm himself and give him peace? The only thing he had to hold on to that he and his family would not perish was the promise of God's Word. God told Noah, you have to enter the ark so that you and your family would be saved from the flood. In other words, if you trust me enough to obey my words, then you will be saved and blessed. It's interesting. This is almost the exact same proposition God gave to Adam and Eve. If you don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you will be saved and you will not die and you will enjoy my blessings. In other words, Adam and Eve, if you trust me enough to obey my words, then you will be saved and blessed. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve didn't trust God enough to obey Him, while Noah did and in the process was saved and did receive God's blessings. My friends, do we trust God enough by faith to obey His words? You see, the hardest part of any faith walk is the faith part, but it is made easier when we understand that the object of our faith is in the Almighty God who is able to save and bless us, and so we can trust His words. Bob Vernon, formerly with the L.A. Police Department, tells of how the department would test bulletproof vests and demonstrate to rookie officers their value by placing these vests on mannequins and then shooting round after round at them. Then they'd check to see if any of the rounds penetrated the vests. Invariably, the vest would pass a test with flying colors, and no bullets would penetrate through the Kevlar. Chief Vernon would then turn to the rookie officers and ask, so do you all believe that wearing a bulletproof vest will stop any bullets and save your life? And all of them would answer yes. Then Vernon would ask, so would any of you volunteer to wear one of those bulletproof vests and let us shoot at you to see if you really believe what you have declared to be true? What would be your reaction if you're one of the rookie officers? Would you volunteer? My friends, do we... Just pay lip service and say, God, I trust you. But when the rubber hits the road and we are faced with great challenges, our actions show that we really don't place full trust in the promises of God's Word. God's unchanging words are what we have to learn to fully trust because often in life, that's the only thing we have to hold on to. We can't hold on or rely on the things of the world because the world's promises are empty the world's promises are temporary. They're always changing, and they are not backed up by anything. The only thing that does not change is God's Word and His promises. His words are backed up by who He is, and His promises are always kept because He controls the future. So His assurances through His words are what we are to trust. 
the object of our faith has to be on God and His Word, or else our faith is not latched onto anything secure, and we will fail miserably when challenges come our way. Willard Aldrich tells a story in his book that in April 1988, the evening news reported on a photographer who was a skydiver. He had jumped from a plane along with numerous other skydivers and filmed the group as they fell and opened their parachutes. On the film shown on the telecast, as the final skydiver opened his chute, the picture went berserk. The news announcer reported that the cameraman had fallen to his death, having jumped out of the plane without his parachute. It wasn't until he reached for the absent ribcord that he realized he was free-falling without a parachute. Until that point, the jump probably seemed exciting and fun, but tragically, he had acted with thoughtless haste and deadly foolishness. Nothing could save him, for his faith was in a parachute never buckled on. Faith in anything but in an all-sufficient God can be just as tragic spiritually. Only with faith in Jesus Christ dare we step into the dangerous excitement of life. Look at me now at verses 19 to 21. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Although God gives us His assurance and promises when He leads us to do something out of the ordinary, we still have to be personally committed to the task and to be responsible to the work He has given. We don't just sit back and say, well, God, I trust you by faith. Thank you for your leading. Now you do the work. God told Noah in these verses that he would be saved through the ark, but Noah still had to build the ark. He still had to get his own food for survival, as verse 21 tells us. He was tasked to keep the animals alive, as verse 19 tells us. He had to get his hands dirty and feed the animals. Living a life of faith doesn't mean we don't do anything and just passively trust God's Word. We also must actively fulfill our responsibilities that He has given us as a tangible evidence of our faith in His Word. Noah still had to build the ark. Adam and Eve still could not eat of the fruit of the forbidden tree. We still have to live out by faith what God has instructed us. I hope you see my point. Faith doesn't mean you and I don't have anything to do. In fact, living by faith means actively fulfilling the responsibilities we have until the day we see our Savior and our work on earth is done. The responsibilities we are charged with may be difficult, as living by faith doesn't guarantee that the way will be easy. But as we trust God's Word and press ahead faithfully doing what God has called us to do, then at the moment of our need, God's help is there to help us get through those times. That is what it means to live by faith while taking up our God-given responsibilities. You know, at most every parking garage or toll booth, there's an automatic gate designed to rise when the car activates a hidden sensor near the entrance or exit. When we drive toward the gate, it remains down, blocking the entrance. But as we get closer, the arm swings up, allowing us to proceed. If I were to park my car a few meters from the gate, the gate would stay closed, only when I move forward does it open. That's a picture of how living a life of faith works. We have a responsibility to drive up to the gate and have faith in God's Word that the arm will automatically swing up to let us through. It is the first step into the unseen and uncertain that proves we have faith. Now let's pull it all together. Our third biblical principle for what it means to live by faith is this. Biblical principle number three. Living by faith involves trusting God's Word while fulfilling His responsibilities for us. Living by faith involves trusting God's Word while fulfilling His responsibilities for us. Is this how we live out our faith walk? We trust in God's Word, but we also do not sit idly by, but live out the many responsibilities God has for us as followers of Jesus Christ. The story is told of a group of people in Kansas who after a long drought came together to pray for rain. As they met, they discovered only one young girl 
but actually brought an umbrella with her. My friends, if we really trust in the promises of God's Word, do we do the work and bring our figurative umbrella? Did the righteous Noah, who lived by faith and walked closely with God, build the ark? Look lastly at verse 22. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. The Bible tells us that Noah was completely obedient to God. In the Hebrew text, there are two verbs for emphasis. Noah did, and so he did. And the emphasis is that Noah completely obeyed God by faith, trusting in His commands without excuses and in submission. And by doing so, as we'll find out in subsequent weeks, saved himself, his family, and the human race. We all know the faith we have doesn't mean anything unless you and I actually live it out. Remember, number one, living by faith requires us to stand apart from the world, even if it means standing alone. Number two, living by faith necessitates us learning not to question God nor give excuses. Number three, living by faith involves trusting God's Word while fulfilling His responsibilities for us. As James Cizu notes well, let it never be forgotten that glamour is not greatness, applause is not fame, prominence is not eminence, the man of the hour is not apt to be the man of the ages. A stone may sparkle, but that does not make it a diamond. People may have money, but that does not make them a success. It is what the unimportant people do that really counts and determines the course of history. The greatest forces in the universe are never spectacular. Summer showers are more effective than hurricanes, but they get no publicity. The world would soon die, but for the fidelity, loyalty, and consecration of those whose names are unhonored and unsung. The Bible tells us that those who live out their lives by faith may have names that are unhonored and unsung in this life, but they will certainly be known forever for all eternity in the life to come. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 is clear evidence of this. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Perhaps unknown to his generation, but because of his faith, Noah is now remembered forever. My friends, you and I may be unknown to our generation because of our simple and quiet faith walk, but also because of our simple and quiet faith walk, our lives will be remembered forever in eternity. May we be remembered as men and women who lived by faith, faithfully serving the Lord until we see Him, and willing to stand apart from the world, even if it means standing alone. May God raise up a generation of Noahs today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for the reminder of what it means to live by faith. We often pay lip service to it, but we don't live out lives of faith. May we do so because of what Your Word tells us to do. May we be willing to stand apart even if it means standing alone. May we learn not to question You so much and not to give excuses and to trust in Your Word. And we pray, Lord, that You would challenge us to fulfill the responsibilities You have for us faithfully until the day we see You. Father, raise up a generation of Noahs for this lifetime so that we can impact this world for You. May your name be glorified and praised through our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.